Right. Today should be interesting because I'm going to rip on my favorite geriatric. I'm going to rip on yeah. millennials. Uh, what else? I'm going to rip on the market in general, I guess, today. How about you? What do you got? Uh, mine's going to be on uh, the, well, two things. One is going to be about uh, the Roth conversion, you know, converting your 401k or, you know, over to a Roth, you know, a Roth conversion. Um, actually, the article turned out to be better than I had anticipated. Um, and then uh, one is going to be about uh, more or less about the Magnificent Seven. Um, there seems to be uh, quite a bit of people talking about uh, this new tech boom. And um, I just don't see it. Welcome, everybody, to The Half Truth, where we're going to talk about the biggest headlines that we think that you should be paying attention to and half truth behind them and what uh, we feel is the other side that they're not really talking about. So welcome. I hope you enjoy today. Um, I'm going to kick it off with my favorite douche, Mr. Jim Cramer, um, who says that we are going to be in a soft landing. So I got a nice little video that I'm going to play for you guys. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your tray tables up and your seat backs in their full upright positions. We're about to land the plane. We're landing on Wall Street. We hope you enjoy your ride on PAL Airlines. And we do hope you will travel with us. Yeah. PAL Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I love it. It's, it's going to be great. That's going to be all over social media, all over the internet when the market finally does implode and we do not have a soft landing. Like, I just, I don't get where he's getting his data from to, to say something like that. Like, I can't say that we're not going to have a soft landing, but I can't say that we are, you know, with the data that's coming out. I just, I don't see what he's looking at to predict that just because the market rallied 11% in the last, what, 20 days? No way. Yeah, I uh, I agree. And in, in, in my uh, what I'll talk about in my article kind of cover the same things is, uh, you know, usually when Jim Cramer and some of these other guys go on CNBC or the articles that are written uh, talking about, you know, these are, you know, strong buys, you know, such and such, uh, you know, analyst team for, gives a strong buy to Microsoft or to such and such company. That usually is when they're ready to, you know, sell. So my suggestion to you is if you get all of those people coming on CNBC writing articles of, hey, go buy Microsoft, go buy this. They're selling into your buying. And you're going to be the one left holding the bag. And that's the real truth, <laughs> part of the half truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll leave that into your article then. What's your article? Um, yeah, so so mine was, is like uh, there was, uh, you know, the top five stocks to buy right now. And it was the five were, uh, you know, five of them are out of this uh, Magnificent Seven. So it was NVIDIA, Microsoft, you know, Google, Tesla, Apple, those ones. And, you know, again, um, you know, I, I think, you know, NVIDIA has, you know, a stronger balance sheet than some of the others, uh, for sure, more than Tesla and, uh, you know, probably more so than, than Microsoft. But, you know, their whole claim to fame, there was, an, uh, there was a video that I'll, give to you, Patrick, so you can put it on the recording so people can see it. But there's a guy from Webbush where he talks about, uh, you know, buying some of these companies that are, you know, driven by AI. And however, you know, I, I don't disagree that it's a disruptive technology. And I think there's value there. But is the value there right now? And is the value there for the the near term future and by near term, I mean, six months, maybe 12 months. No, I mean, we had all of the, all of the pops from AI in the stocks have all already happened. You know, it's kind of like the crypto thing. It's kind of like the dot com thing. It's kind of like, you know, all of those things, everybody already invested in them. Everybody already made their money. You know, now it's just, we're going to see what's going to happen and how the rollout of AI is going to play a part in everybody's lives when it comes to, you know, retail people, when it comes to, you know, shipping companies, all of that fun stuff. 
but but the money's already been made and I, it's hard for me to believe that they're going to continue to have the growth rate that they've had call it the last 10 years so you know once again here we are at when people are telling you these big what they consider to be i guess called big wigs on wall street telling you hey go out and get microsoft hey go out and get this go out and get that go get tesla i would be very leery as we are you know Personally, I mean, I'm not buying any of those. If anything, I'm looking to potentially short them personally. <laughs> but, you know, again, just more people trying to convince you of something that really is, you know, at the top of the, you know, it's it's more at, it's closer to its high than it is to its bottom. Let's just put it that way. We've already discussed that, you know, the leaders that have given us the last 15 years are not going to be the leaders, you know, after this next recession. So. You know, you brought up the point that they're selling or they're they're doing that to try and juice because hedge funds are 99%, you know, all in these five, seven stocks. So there's no mm -hmm. more room for growth because there's nobody, no more buyers unless they get the retailers in. And those are the only ones that have really rallied this year. But to your point of AI and NVIDIA, you know, there was an article, NVIDIA, you know, increased by $280 million billion dollars or something like that, which is seven times their annual, you know, revenue. So it, it just can't sustain that. But to go back to the point of AI, it's just generative AI, which means it's not really doing anything other than scrubbing the internet for information that's already out there and then repackaging it up into a new turd, you know? So it's, it's not, it's not really AI. It's just, it is the AI and the fact that it's scrubbing the internet but it's not doing anything for us, you know, other than just taking information that's already there. So I, I agree that AI is not there. It's, it's the future and, you know, it's coming, but it's not there yet for what the hype is all about. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I want to talk about inflation because inflation has <laughs> kind of what triggered or started this rally this week um, or, or the end of last week. And, you know, the headline that I have, I got two of them that kind of play off each other. Um, inflation drop triggers market rally. Economists reassess after an uh, October results because the last recession numbers came in at, you know, 3.7 instead of 3.9. And that headline talks about inflation dropping. And it's skewing that because, sure, it's not rising as fast as it was. But inflation hasn't dropped. That's it. We're still going up by almost 4%, which is a huge amount. Like, you're not keeping up, you know, even your cash that's earning 5% is barely keeping up with their, you know, fake inflation numbers, where real inflation is still 9, 10%. Um, so, I mean, inflation hasn't dropped. And that's what people don't understand when these headlines come out. Inflation hasn't come down. It's just not accelerating by the speed that it was last year of seven, eight, nine percent per month or year over year or whatever, you know, however they calculated based on the numbers they put out. And that's what I think a lot of people aren't paying attention to is that it's not coming down. It's just not going as fast. Yeah. I agree. And and best way, best way for you folks to realize this, if you don't already know it, is how much is a price of steak? How much is a price of bacon? eggs milk is that's has that come down significantly not for me not when i go to stater brother or i go to ralph's to buy you know four new york steaks and i get to spend forty dollars <laughs> yeah. it's insane well and that's because of all the inflation that's kicked in but the other article that i have it said the 11 things that are getting cheaper and it's airfare rental cars used vehicles gasoline toys Household energy and school books, you know, are the are the main, the biggest ones. And it's like school books affect such a small amount of people. Household energy, right. I mean, that's a, a cyclical, you know, summertime type of thing. Toys, that that just means China's, you know, gotten us even more. Gas is a is a limited, you know, time period. Used vehicles, that's because it's what it went up by like fifty percent in a year. Um, rental cars because the economy is struggling so they they got to reduce their prices and same with airfare like they see that on the horizon so they're reducing to incentivize you know that type of stuff so it's all very cyclical of what has reduced and then i'll share this graph but on the upside you know it's all the things that matter 
you know, food, rentals, housing, earnings, you know, all that type of stuff where that's still astronomical. So it's, it's comical how they can skew the numbers and, and how they, the headline spins it. So I like, there's two things I wanted to talk about within that. So you said, I think it was household energy. I, I don't know yeah. why that's coming down. We can barely keep the lights on across the nation and we're going into the winter <laughs> and it's going to be a cold one, well, according to, summer. you know, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's I mean, we can barely, you know, people aren't, Yeah, they can leave their window open. They don't have to run the AC or turn the heat on. But, you know, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I have a hard time believing that household energy is uh, is on the the decline as a uh, as a trend or a pattern versus just maybe a short term blip, like you said, kind of cyclical. But, you know, we're going into the to the winter. And if we have a pretty cold winter, I, I have a suspicion, sneaking suspicion we will. Uh, you know, people's energy prices are going to be skyrocketing because, you know, most of the grids across the nation can't handle the uh, energy consumptions that most houses uh, are, you, you know, need, uh, especially here in California. I mean, those of you who own a Tesla uh, understand that <laughs> during the summer months, they tell you, you're right, I should say as a whole, they tell you to go buy an electric car. But during the summer months, you can't charge it because it's eating up too much electricity. <laughs> I mean, for those of you who have solar panels on your house, forget any of this. But those of you who don't, <laughs> you can't charge your car. And then, uh, you know, electric vehicles typically don't work very well in the in the cold. So that was that's another fun thing. What did you say after household income? There was two other things. Their um, household well, energy, know. rather. Yeah, the energy thing. I just got a letter from SoCal Gas saying that I can subscribe to alerts or text messages to when my gas rate is going to spike, you know, because we all remember last January, you know, prices went from, you know, 18 cents a therm or whatever it is to like six dollars, you know, a therm. So the gas company is already preparing for, you know, a surge in prices that they want to, you know, alert me to when the prices are going to go up. Um, but the other ones were toys, gasoline, used vehicles, rental cars, airfare, school books and supplies. So used vehicles was the other big one. So, you know, you're saying that's the prices have come down, right? Yeah. Is what the, what the article said? Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, uh, that's a hard no. <laughs> and if they have come down, they're still not selling because you know, I have a friend, we both have a friend who, you know, works in the used car department <laughs> of, you know, how he makes money. And, you know, that market has gone completely away. Nobody's buying cars. And what are they, why are they not buying cars? Well, that is because of interest rates. You're paying, you know, eight, nine, 12% on a car loan now. <laughs> are you kidding me? You know, of course, nobody's going to go and buy, you know, so so how can prices, you know, they're having perhaps I guess the argument is, is they're having to lower prices so people will buy them. But again, it, same thing with the house. Nobody's selling homes because they don't want to get rid of their three percent mortgage and go into an eight percent mortgage. Nobody wants to buy a home if they don't own one and going into an eight to ten percent mortgage is the same thing. It's ridiculous. Of course, yeah. nobody's going to buy well, and even reduce the prices. prices are and that's right. why they're saying they're coming down because they can't sell them. You know, all the EVs are, you know, even the new EVs are sitting on a lot. You know, they have a way bigger, you know, inventory than they plan because people are just not buying, like you said. Right. You, you know, I guess, you know, the, the probably correct in that prices are coming down, but that's fine, you know, uh, for the article. But that doesn't mean people are buying. Nobody's going out and buying these cars because, again, to, you know, your point, our point of, you know, your your car loan is going to be 8%, 10% um, or more, depending on your, you know, credit rating and how much you put down and those kinds of things. But, yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, the, uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, school supplies, you know, whatever. <laughs> the kids don't even want to go to school anymore anyways. Right. What was your other article? So my other article was about um, Roth conversions. 
Um, I've had a lot of questions, you know, through, you know, probably the last 12 months, even 18 months about Roth conversions. And surprisingly, this article comes from one of the, uh, you know, we've talked about these articles, or at least I have before, where it's like called Ask an Advisor. And usually those articles are pretty ridiculous because, you know, they're, they're super ambiguous, like we've talked about. Um, they're, uh, and they don't really give you good, solid information. It's just kind of, you know, just just very ambiguous, very just general information. And there's really nothing you can take of substance from those articles. But in this particular one, there was one there was one part in the article. Um, and really what a quick overview of Roth conversion is, is if you have, you know, a tax deferred account over on over here and you want to convert it over to a Roth, you're going to have to pay the taxes that you essentially deferred from the time that you started your other account. Um, usually people, this was a big hot topic about what, three, four years ago, Patrick, there was a lot of people kind of really going after these Roth conversions. And the problem is, is if you do it all at once and you're in your, you know, coming up into your retirement age or even in retirement, Doing that all at once, you're going to have to pay a massive tax bill, which is really dumb. Um, but the important part in this article that I found that I actually really liked, and I'm going to give them some credit, is they said if you do do a Roth conversion, that you would want to do it over stages, not all in one lump sum, which I actually agree with. If you are going to really consider doing a Roth conversion, it is very important for you to consider how quickly you do it, not doing it in one lump sum, taking it over stages. And I'll, you know, you'll see this little paragraph in the, uh, in this article, but that was the most important part. Uh, the rest of the article is total, you know, bullshit or just, you know, not really informative. So if you do are thinking or considering a doing a Roth conversion, really consider and think about not doing it all at once doing it over stages so you don't keeping your tax bracket um, the same and not increasing it so you're paying more taxes um, so stuff to think about i'm just giving them a little bit of credit when credits due versus <laughs> knocking them like we usually do so uh that was kind of all i had for for that thing well and we've we've done and on our blog page there's an extensive article that talks about the proper right. ways to do to do a Roth conversion. And I'll give you a point myself, like I'm trying to do a Roth conversion as well, um, but I'm only doing a piece, you know, and I'm waiting. One of the strategies that, we're, you, that you utilize is <clears throat> I have an asset in there that let's say it's worth $10,000. Well, because it's a real estate asset, I can actually reduce the value by using a CPA and, and forms with the IRS and all of that type of stuff. And let's say I make it show that that value, if I was to try and liquidate it, was only worth $5,000. Well, now I take that $5,000 and I do a Roth conversion and I only pay taxes on $5,000, but really in my Roth, I have $10,000 of value because eventually that asset is going to get sold for its true value that's in there. So I'm able to pay less taxes on that same $10,000 of, of value. And that's just one strategy to kind of utilize when you're doing a Roth conversion rather than just paying the full full amount straight out or you know doing it in stages and all that type of stuff so yeah there's right. there's, there's yeah. way more to it and it's very specific just like everything to what you need what you're looking for and all that type of stuff well and another thing I would say to think about is you know let's say you're 70 years old or 68 years old and somebody an advisor gets you to uh, convert your your Roth or your IRA over to a Roth or do a Roth conversion. And you live, you know, let's say a year goes by and you get mowed over by a bus. Well, you just paid the government all of those taxes that you really didn't have to pay because if it would have just transferred over to the beneficiaries, they're going to get a step up in basis and all of that stuff. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just uh, you're you're giving your money to Uncle Sam when you don't really need to, and in, in that kind of case, scenario, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, my last article rips on millennials and Gen Zs. Um, Starbucks employees at hundreds of U.S. stores walk out on Red Cup Day, 
And it's because they're complaining about pay, staffing, schedules, all that type of stuff. And my complaint to this is that it's the every job needs a living wage mentality. And I'm sorry, that's just not going to cut it in our in our economy, our world. Like to be a burger flipper, to be a, you know, barista, I'm sorry, your job should not be a living wage. There's there's no reason for that. You're you're just perpetuating the cycle of inflation by requesting that, demanding that get a second job like majority of other people do, you know, and that type of thing. That there's just jobs out there that should not be a living wage. And I'm hoping this recession washes that out and we become, you know, realize and wake up that that can't happen and that can't continue. Yeah, I would add, and I, I should go back and look for this uh, uh, stat um, or little snippet of information that has to do with this. So, you know, there's a lot of talk, like you were saying, the living wage, raising the minimum wage and a lot of that stuff. Well, there was a study done that showed that employees that enter into the workforce at the base level, call it whatever the minimum wage is or whatever the lowest tier is. So if you're at a burger place, perhaps it's flipping burgers or, you know, handling the cash register, right? They're the bottom of the rung. In this, in this study, they showed that like 70 to 80 percent of those people within six months, six to 18 months, somewhere in there. So whether it's six months, 12 months or 18 months had either increased their pay by because they wanted to do a different position or move up within the company. So if you're, you know, you work at the register, now you want to be a supervisor. So within six to 18 months, this, this, this uh, article or, or charge or stats showed that 80% of the time, all those employees usually move up the ladder wherever it is. So this whole thing of, you know, we need to raise minimum wage because they can't afford to live and blah, 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 blah. Again, 80% of the people that work at the bottom rung of most of these jobs, usually within six to 18 months, are on their way to becoming a supervisor, a manager, or working at a different place where they make more money. It has nothing to do with, you know, we need to support these people that work at the bottom of the barrel need to have, you know, enough to survive or enough for this. It's like most, again, most of those people are just coming out of high school or college and they need a job. And usually, like I said, within six to 18 months, they're either moving to another job where they're making more money. They're moving up within the company to make more money. So all of that stuff about increasing minimum wage, you know, those types of things, it's all BS because again, the, the data shows, like we've talked about data, always go look at the data. The data never lies. So I, I, I'll have to go back and find this for you. Huh? The science. Go look at the science. <laughs> yeah, go look at the science, right? <laughs> well, and I'm not knocking, you know, the baristas. I'm not knocking the burger flippers. It's in a, you know, no, it needs to be not done. at all. They're, they're college workers, things like that. I'm just saying it's it's not feasibly possible in any economy for those jobs to be a living wage because it's never going to be a living wage. In order to make that no. living wage, they have to charge twenty dollars a burger, and mm -hmm. nobody's going to buy that. Or if they do buy that, it's you can't afford it now. It's your living wage. It's just, it's not possible. Right. I mean, I don't know about you, but my first job when I turned 16 and got my driver's license, I worked at Petco. <laughs> I made five seventy five an hour. I think I worked there for eight or nine months. Or no, I guess it was like a year and a half. And then I left there and I went and got a job at Marriott. And I went from five seventy five an hour to nine dollars an hour <laughs> so you know i went somewhere else i got paid more i also got the opportunity for tips so at the end of the day i was probably making you know 11 12 dollars an hour back in you know 2002 you know but i had money i was making money and then when i was at marriott i moved up i went from 
working bottom of the barrel to becoming a supervisor. I worked as a cook. I worked as a bartender. I did all those. So, I mean, just even in my own life, I can, you know, use, you know, what I've done to kind of help prove that that's, that data is actually pretty accurate. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I definitely never stayed stagnant where I wanted to just be, you know, working the cash register at Marriott or at, at Petco. <laughs> Well, I said last week, you know, on our video, my first year at the airlines, I, I barely broke $20,000. You know, I spent over right, $100,000 yeah. on all my flying certificates and all that type of stuff. And here, my first job out of college as an airline pilot, I can't, you know, I'm living on food stamps. But you didn't, right. you know, we couldn't do anything about it. Like, it was just, you deal with it, you work your way up, you 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 progress, you get a second job, you do whatever you need to, to, to make it happen, you know, type of thing. So yep. I think we've just lost our way as a country. And, and I think the I, recession will, will shake that out. I'm hopeful anyways. I'm hopeful as well. We just need it to actually happen. I don't, I don't think there's no soft landing. I think it just needs to crash and burn. <laughs> and uh, on that note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again next week <laughs> yeah thanks for tuning in guys we'll see you later